Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, lecture on quantitative metallography. And I will begin by explaining why we need to think a little bit about how uh, to deduce three-dimensional information from observations made in two dimensions. And this problem is even more important nowadays because many of the sophisticated pieces of equipment that we have uh, have software which gives you the answers automatically. Uh, the problem is that most people uh, do not interpret those results sufficiently to think about, for example, error bars and so on. So I hope to give you an elementary introduction to the quantitative aspects of metallography. Now here is the structure of perlite. Uh, you can see that there are cementite particles and ferrite particles and this is a transmission electron micrograph. On this side you have uh, an optical micrograph. You can see the scale here is much coarser and these are colonies of perlite that are growing into austenite here. So this is a two, these are both effectively two-dimensional sections of the structure. Hello? Hi. Hello. Excuse me, what are you saying? Okay. Okay, so these are both effectively two-dimensional sections. And the way that perlite is taught uh, is that it consists of alternating layers of ferrite, cementite, ferrite, cementite. But Hillert back in the 1950s showed that this is not actually a good interpretation of the structure because all of the cementite is connected in three dimensions and all of the ferrite is connected in three dimensions. In other words, we have an interpenetrating bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. And the way I'll illustrate this is to show you this image. On this side we have a cabbage and all the leaves of the cabbage are connected. Uh, so imagine that this is your cementite, your single crystal of cementite and you put it into a bucket of water and the water is ferrite. Then that is the structure of cementite. What we do when we look at this at a high magnification is we see alternating layers of cabbage, water, cabbage, water. But in three dimensions, a colony of perlite is simply a bicrystal. So sometimes when we make observations from two-dimensional sections, the interpre interpretation can be very misleading. Uh, the same applies, for example, to uh, cast iron, where we see flakes of graphite. Uh, but in fact, in three dimensions, uh, the graphite flakes are connected at the point where it started to form. All this uh, has consequences on mechanical properties. So, for example, the toughness of perlite does not depend on the interlamellar spacing. It depends on the size of the perlite colony because effectively that's the crystallographic unit of fracture. The strength might vary with the interlamellar spacing, but the toughness does not. Okay, so let me begin with some uh, stereology. And uh, by international agreement, these are the sort of symbols that we use. So capital P stands for points, capital A for flat areas. Then we have the volume, uh, lines, curved surfaces as opposed to flat surfaces. And this is a number, for example, the number of counts that we make. And these symbols can be combined in different way to produce, again, internationally recognized symbols, where S with a subscript V means the amount of curved area per unit volume. For example, the grain boundary area per unit volume. Here we have the volume fraction, uh, the volume divided by the total volume and this is the point fraction and so on. You can make various combinations of these terms in order to describe the microstructure. So here we are then uh, uh, 
this is a typical uh, two phase mixture where we have a black phase and a white phase and we really want to work out the volume fraction but we cannot uh, visualize these in three dimensions so what we do instead is we measure the area fraction so for example a mod modern scanning electron microscope will give you the area fraction automatically uh, although of course uh, it also depends on the contrast between the phases so what is the error in making this measurement for example if I just measure two of these objects then I will get a different answer from when I measure all four of these objects so the square of the error depends on the number of areas that you count capital N here is the number of areas so this is one, two, three, and four. This is the standard deviation in the area of these objects because you can see that the areas are not equal. And this is the mean area of these four objects. So if you take the standard deviation, divide by the mean area, and this is the number of counts that gives you the square of the error that you expect in the volume fraction. And this is really important. Uh, there should be no paper published where you say I have a volume fraction of 0 0.26 because it should be 0 0.26 plus or minus a certain error depending on how many measurements have been done what is the standard deviation of these areas and what is the mean area if the standard deviation is 0 that means all of these are of exactly identical area then this term disappears and we simply have this term which comes from random noise in other words if I pick four areas in one region and another four areas in another region I'm going to get a different answer because of the number of measurements that I've made so it's very important when quoting volume fractions uh, deducing them from area fractions that you also quote the error in the measurement and this error represents 67 percent confidence if you want to represent your data with 95 percent confidence then you double this error so it will be if, if the error is 0 0.26 plus or minus 0 0.03 then it would be 0 0.26 plus or minus 0 0.06 if you want 95 percent confidence so this is standard statistical theory now Another method of measuring the volume fraction is to project random lines onto the structure and those lines will have a certain intercept in the black phase and another intercept in the white phase. So you add up all those interface, uh, intercepts and this gives you the mean lineal intercept in the white phase and the mean lineal intercept in the dark phase and these are the standard deviations in the linear intercepts in the dark and the bright phase and the error also depends on how much material you have of a particular phase and the number of measurements so this is a more complicated error measurement than we had in the area fraction so again modern instruments uh, usually have a method of giving you these linear intercepts automatically but they do not give you a good uh, appreciation of the errors involved in the measurement so these are things which you may need to calculate manually depending on how many intercepts have been measured the volume fraction and the standard deviations in the values of the intercepts the point fraction uh, and again if you look at digital images these points might represent pixels so the system might be able to tell you automatically how many of the pixels fall into the alpha phase and how many fall into the beta phase and therefore you can work out the volume fraction simply at the proportion of points that fall into your phase of interest and the error is simply given by the random statistics that means one over the total number of points is equal to the square of the error for 67 percent confidence so uh, all of these methods uh, can be applied manually or automatically. Uh, manual uh, application is necessary when the contrast between your phases uh, is very poor and you do not have, uh, for example, uh, electron backscattered diffraction uh, 
imaging facilities which identify phases by their crystal structure. Okay, so uh, we've worked out how to measure the volume fractions. Uh, we are also interested in the sizes of grains in our material because as every material scientist knows, in general, when we reduce the size of the crystals in a polycrystalline material, we tend to get a stronger and tougher material uh, in general. Now, this is a fracture surface from an alloy which has been deliberately made brittle so that it breaks along the grain boundaries. So these are actually three-dimensional grains because the structure has broken at the grain surfaces. And you can see here you have the grain junctions now these shapes are of course quite complicated and uh, the angles between the grain boundaries will not be possible to make in uh, 120 degrees in three dimensions so we represent the shapes of grains in three dimensions by idealized structures which i will show you later so this particular material has what we call equiaxed grains. That means the grain size is the same in all directions. But you can also have circumstances where the grains are anisotropic. Here, for example, the grains are growing in the direction of maximum heat flow in a welded component. So these are columnar grains. So how do we represent the sizes of these grains? Okay, let's see. So in three dimensions, an equiax grain is normally represented like this, which is a Kelvin uh, tetrachidecahedron. It consists of hexagons and squares. Okay. And the reason why this shape is because the angles between grain boundary junctions are approximately approaching 120 degrees which is uh, gives you equilibrium in all three directions but it's not exactly 120 degrees because that's impossible and the second point to note is that whenever we have a grain shape it must also be able to fill space in other words i can take these tetrachidecahedra stack them in three dimensions and there would be no holes left in the structure because in a polycrystalline material, in general, the grains all fit together without leaving empty spaces. And a shape like this might represent the columnar grains that I showed you. So this is a hexagonal prism. It has a hexagonal cross section and the dimension C is much bigger than the dimension A. Okay, so here's your polycrystalline material. All these are a single phase and you've got lots and lots of uh, crystals. Uh, there are also these uh, straight looking objects which are annealing twins, but effectively they're also grain boundaries. Uh, so how do we measure the size? Well, uh, mean linear intercept means you project a line at random onto this structure. For example, a line parallel to this red marker and you measure the intercepts that the line make between grain boundaries. So for example, here and here, and here and here, and so on. And you make sufficient measurements to give you statistically meaningful results. And that gives you a very well-defined relationship between the mean length of all these intercepts. So this is a mean linear intercept and the amount of surface per unit volume. So this is a stereologically very fundamental relationship because what we are interested in is how much grain boundary area we have in a unit volume of material. The larger that area is, the smaller is the mean free path for dislocations to move and therefore the stronger will be your material. So the mean linear intercept is the best way of defining grain size because stereologically it's directly related, uh, uh, sorry, inversely related to the amount of surface per unit volume. And the amount of surface per unit volume has profound effects on the mechanical properties.
So the best way to measure the grain size is by a mean linear intercept. Now, many articles in journals, for example this one, make the mistake that they assume that this is a grain size. Okay, here is a grain which is larger than this grain. But that simply isn't correct because we are looking at a two-dimensional section and this grain underneath might actually be larger than this grain. So this figure here where they say it's a ferrite plate thickness, they don't really mean that. What they mean is that the intercepts that they have measured, which represent apparent size, okay, not the true size, but the apparent size, are plotted along this horizontal axis. If I take a mean value of all these numbers, then that gives me the grain size. So if I go back to this equation, it's the mean value of the linear intercept which gives me the grain size, the surface per unit volume. An individual measurement is not very meaningful because you do not know how this grain behaves under the surface or above the surface. But because of the ease with which we can get these data in scanning electron microscopes, people have started to publish many papers where they assume that the size being plotted here is the size of a, an individual grain, but it's actually an apparent mean linear intercept. So be careful about that. There is only one grain size that you can get from these data, which is the mean linear intercept. And of course we are assuming uh, that there is a uniform distribution of grains in the material. If there wasn't, then this distribution would be bimodal. Okay, so you have to test that this distribution follows a normal distribution. If it is bimodal, then you actually have a mixture of grain sizes in your material. Okay, so just to summarize, the very best measure of grain size is a mean linear intercept. Now, this is uh, uh, an image from a scanning electron microscope. And we can see that there is a small grain here, uh, apparently small grain here, and an apparently large grain here. I emphasize once again that we should not assume that this grain is small and this grain is large because we do not know what's happening above and below this image. Uh, the other point is that in a scanning electron microscope, it will immediately give you the area of this grain and of this grain and so on. So that is a mean aerial intercept. It is again not a grain size, it is simply a grain being sectioned along a random plane. So uh, let's apply our very elementary measure of grain size just to show you that the linear intercept is a wonderful measure because it gives us immediately the amount of surface per unit volume. So let's assume that we've got this grain structure, we've done linear intercept measurements and arrived at a value of the linear intercept, which is inversely related to the amount of surface per unit volume. If I, if I multiply the amount of surface per unit volume by the grain boundary energy per unit area, then that gives me the cost of creating grain boundaries. So this is the free energy that you need to supply to the material in order to create this much surface per unit volume and this grain size. So this very simple equation immediately tells you that if you have, for example, a hundred joules per mole of free energy available, then there is only a certain grain size that you can get from that free energy. So if I uh, take this a little bit further, uh, where is this free energy coming from? It comes from phase transformation, for example, from austenite to ferrite. So if I have a certain value of the chemical driving force for transformation, that immediately predicts the smallest possible grain size achievable, all right? You cannot exceed this grain size because then the cost of interface energy will uh, become too high. So here, for example, is the 
grain size obtained in thermomechanical processing of steels and this is the free energy being plotted here so if you undercool the material below the equilibrium temperature you have a greater free energy and therefore you achieve a much smaller grain size here so notice that uh, all of these data are from commercial steels and we are far from achieving the minimum grain size in commercial steels so we need to focus on how to modify our thermomechanical processing route in order to get even finer grain sizes than we do today and therefore obtain higher strength and higher toughness in steels now this is another method of characterizing grain size uh, you have a grid in your microscope and you compare your grain structure with a particular region of the grid if it roughly matches then you get what's known as an ASTM grain size number American Society for Testing of Materials grain size number and it's a very peculiar parameter uh, this is the ASTM grain size number and this is the number of grains you have per square inch okay uh, at a magnification of 100 so this kind of a grain size parameter is not terribly scientific it's simply to enable you to communicate a grain size but you can't do much with it in terms of uh, modeling for example the strength or other properties of your material it's purely a communication device that I have a certain grain size ASTM number 5 which means that in a square inch at a magnification of 100 I have 16 grains you need to know about it because it's often used in industry now coming back to the anisotropic grains we have a complication in the case of the isotropic grains uh, the mean linear intercept is sufficient to completely define the amount of surface you have per unit volume but for anisotropic grains that's no longer true because the mean linear intercept depends both on the short axis and the long axis and what we want is these two bits of information so if you want to obtain both A and C then you not only have to measure the mean linear intercept but also the mean aerial intercept and then solve these equations simultaneously now the example that I've given you is of hexagonal prisms which accurately represent columnar grains but if you have for example pancake grains then these relationships will be different and right at the end of this lecture I'll give you references where you can obtain uh, parameters defining the shape of your object the linear intercept and the aerial intercept associated with those shapes so for anisotropic grain structures it is not straightforward to define a grain size because you necessarily want two different parameters at least okay so I've already talked about uh, the statistical errors where you know your error depends on the number of grains that you count or the number of intercepts that you count or the number of points that you count but there are in addition other errors so when you etch a material you're effectively creating steps on the surface and that is why you're able to distinguish between grains now if this step is very high then obviously there's going to be a region here of confusion when you look at it from above that does this region belong to the lower grain the upper grain your boundary effectively becomes very broad so the error that you introduce by etching heavily and you can define the etch by this height here is if you take the height you multiply by the amount of surface per unit volume then that gives you an error here uh, which is a volume fraction which is not the true volume fraction here okay so the lesson from this is do not etch your samples very heavily and this is where a scanning electron microscope with EBSD has an advantage because in fact you do not etch the sample 
when you measure take measurements on that secondly if you are looking in a, a transmission electron microscope uh, you have a certain thickness of foil and some of the particles in your thin foil will be completely enclosed others will be intercepted by the free surface that introduces another error into your volume fraction which depends on the thickness of your foil and the size of your particles because if you simply measure the volume fraction of particles you have by looking at the projected areas then that is not going to give you the true volume fraction simply because some particles will be totally enclosed in the material and others will not similarly the resolution of your technique uh, in other words the angle over which you collect reflected beams into your objective lens uh, is a fundamental resolution of your microscope you cannot get better than that resolution and therefore your grain boundary width will be affected by the resolution of the technique that you're using that introduces another error in your measurement now um, apart from the errors which are very well understood you know the errors due to randomness and those due to etching uh, you also have the problem that we now have very high resolution instruments which means that you may not be looking at a representative amount of material so here is a very simple calculation that I've done if I take absolutely every transmission electron micrograph that has ever been published and let's assume that there are a million of these micrographs published each year and that we've been looking through a transmission electron microscope for 40 years and a typical magnification of 50,000 times and a foil thickness here of 10 to the minus 7 meters and this is a typical size of the micrograph if I calculate the total amount of material that has ever been examined in a transmission electron microscope it comes to just 10 to the minus 4 kilograms and this is the weight of a pin so you are examining an incredibly small amount of material when you look in a transmission electron microscope if I now talk about the atom probe then you are looking at orders of magnitude smaller amount of material when you have images from the atom probe so it's never a good idea to look at your materials using just high resolution techniques you've got to cover a whole range of techniques starting from optical microscopy macroscopic examination all the way to atoms some problems you can only examine at high resolution so for example if you're looking at the dislocation structure of a grain boundary it really doesn't matter uh, you, you know you don't need to uh, look at that using an optical microscope you cannot look at that using an optical microscope so it depends on your problem if you're looking at volume fractions then a TEM is not the right way of doing things now uh, there is a, another set of stereological parameters which uh, describes shape so the images shown here are of chocolates so each one of these is a chocolate and these are supposed to be spherical all right so this is some work I did many years ago on the roundness of these spheres because if they are not round then you use a different amount of chocolate than when they are round and the manufacturer wants to produce them to as uniform a shape as possible so how do you define roundness well uh, one one parameter here is in these projections if I measure the perimeter of each of these chocolates so P is now the perimeter and I also measure the area that is projected then P squared the perimeter squared over 4 pi into A is a dimensionless number okay so a perimeter is 2 pi R okay 
uh, so if I take uh, four uh, four by uh, sorry two by r squared yeah so this should be uh, that's four by squared r squared divide by this I get a dimensionless number which is one if your object is completely uh, round and it deviates from one when it's not round so this is a method of defining the shape of your object and there are other parameters that you use for non-uniform shapes so for example this is a ferret diameter and modern transmission uh, modern scanning electron microscopes also give you this number but you need to understand that it's a very rough measurement of uh, the size of the object because if I measure along a different orientation I will get a different answer for the ferret diame ferre diameter this is uh, known as a convex perimeter which if I put a string around the object then it is the length of that string so when we get to rough objects like these we have a problem okay and I'll come back to this problem later on when we talk about fractal dimensions okay so here are some shape parameters so this particular parameter has a maximum value of one for a true circle and it defines the roundness of the object and any deviation from one uh, tells you how far you are away from circularity uh, this is now the convex perimeter which I illustrated in the previous slide here the convex perimeter and uh, basically it's the same as this but ignores any indentation in the surface the length over the thickness of an object is usual, uh, useful if you want to isolate fibers in the image and this is for isolating clumps of particles in your image as well so all of this is very nicely described in the references that I will give you at the end which helps you to distinguish between shapes of different uh, phases in your material uh, this is another stereological parameter which is extremely important uh, when you have a multi-phase mixture whether it is fibers inside a composite or you have a mixture of alpha and beta in brass uh, we often need to know whether the phases are connected in three dimensions because if for example the diffusion rate is much faster in one phase than in the other it matters whether the fast diffusing phase is connected in three dimensions or not so uh, for transport in multi-phase alloys um, obviously if the phase fraction is evolving with time then the percolation will also change as a function of time so here is a simple illustration you can think about these either as cracks or as fibers in a polymer matrix composite uh, here clearly these fibers are not connected okay um, because the fraction of fibers is really quite small if you look at this I could actually progress from one side of this diagram to the other side going simply through the fibers in this two-dimensional projection okay so in this case you would expect the material if these are cracks you would expect it to fall apart with a small stress in this case the cracks would need to grow before the material breaks so this we say is below the amount of cracks is below the percolation threshold and this is above the percolation threshold and the properties of the material change dramatically as you uh, approach the percolation threshold so for example if you are adding carbon nanotubes to polymer when those carbon nanotubes start to touch each other the electrical conductivity of your material will shoot up and the relationship is something like this so this is the percolation threshold that means the uh, minimum volume fraction that you need in order for all the carbon nanotubes to be touching and this is the actual volume fraction that you have and this is an mostly an empirically used parameter which says how your property will change as you approach the percolation threshold so this three-dimensional connectivity has a huge effect on the properties of your material and when you add carbon nanotubes to polymer matrix uh, 
uh, to a polymer matrix, they may not have any particular effect uh, noticeable macroscopically until they start to touch each other. I will give you more examples of this. So we expect large changes if your phase fraction approaches the percolation threshold. And that percolation threshold depends on the shape of your phase as well. Obviously, if it's fibers, then the situation will be different from if it's spheres. Uh, I was uh, beginning to talk about uh, fractal dimensions and how to treat uh, an object which is truly rough. So roughness uh, is defined as follows. So here I have a set of calipers, all right? And imagine this is the coastline of a country. If I set the calipers at a certain distance here, and then I use them to measure the perimeter of this coastline, I will get a certain answer. So I plot a point, the logarithm of that perimeter versus the distance here, which is my resolution of my calipers. Now, obviously, if I make this distance with, uh, for these calipers much larger, then I will not pick up the detail in the surface. Okay. So if I have a very large value of eta here, then I will get a different answer for the perimeter. If I have an extremely small distance between these two sharp points, in other words, a high resolution, then I will get a much higher perimeter. Okay. So if I plot the logarithm of the measured perimeter of that object, versus the logarithm of the resolution with which I measure, in other words, the distance between these two points, then fractal theory due to Mandelbrot tells me that I get a straight line and the slope of that line is 1 minus capital D, which is the fractal dimension. Now, the fractal dimension D is a very fundamental parameter because once you have that value, you can work out the perimeter at any resolution that you like. Now, why is this important? Well, here is uh, the structure of steel and we have a plate of bainite here, right? And we are looking here at a resolution of 50 micrometers. So this is a single plate of bainite. If I now look at this using a transmission electron microscope, that same plate actually consists of thousands of small platelets, okay? And if I go to even higher magnification and look at one of these objects here, then look, there is much more detail and even higher resolution, now going to three, then I have other little platelets mixed in. So depending on the resolution with which I observe this object, Okay, this apparently in an optical microscope, this is a single plate of Bainer. A transmission electron microscope is thousands of connected plates. And as I go to even higher resolution, there's even finer detail. So depending on how I measure the surface area of this object, which in an optical microscope appeared to be a single plate, yeah, I will get a different answer. So we did a fractal analysis and we obtained the dimension of this object as 3.59. It's a three-dimensional object, but the dimension is 3.59 because it is not a smooth object. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that the amount of surface per unit area, the interface between this product and the parent phase, varies according to the resolution with which you do the measurement. So this is the resolution. It could be micrometers, it could be nanometers, it could be anything that you choose. Now, why is this important? Well, supposing that I'm measuring the toughness, then the size of the plastic zone is of the order of a millimeter. So I would use here a millimeter to define the amount of surface per unit volume. In other words, the grain size effective in controlling toughness. On the other hand, if I'm measuring the absorption of hydrogen onto the surface, then I would put this as one atom. And the amount of surface per unit volume would be much, much greater uh, in influencing the amount of hydrogen that is trapped on the interfaces. So this is, the fractal dimension is a very fundamental uh, 
parameter which is of great importance when you're dealing with rough objects. You cannot say that I have so much of a grain size until you define what you want to do with that grain size. Okay, so this is an extremely important point when dealing with objects which are not smooth. Okay, I hope that is clear to everybody. This is a, another example where we have these plates of ferrite and we have these regions of austenite. This is an extremely fine structure. This is a nanotube on the same scale, carbon nanotube on the same scale. So effectively the grain size here is of the order of 20 nanometers, all right? the thickness of these plates, which is the mean free slip distance. Now we wanted to look at uh, how this material behaves mechanically uh, and when we stress the material the austenite tends to decompose into martensite that's known as the trip effect so we have three different samples starting with different contents of austenite as we pull the material the amount of austenite decreases because it transforms into martensite and what we observed was that fracture happens when the volume fraction of austenite reaches a value of about 0 0.1. Now why is that? Uh, this is a, a test that we did uh, in situ in, in neutron diffraction where we are pulling the tensile specimen and again we find that the sample fractures when we get to a volume fraction of 0 0.1. Well, let's again look at percolation. So imagine that the blue phase is the austenite. I can draw a line continuously through that austenite. So we are above the percolation threshold. But as the austenite decreases, I can, whoops, as the austenite decreases, I can no longer do that. I can no longer draw a continuous path. And the austenite that has disappeared is now very hard martensite, which fractures very easily. So the conclusion is, that when the amount of austenite drops below the percolation threshold, you get fracture. So this provides a method of predicting the ductility of the material. It's an amazing uh, result that when you lose continuity in the austenite, you get fracture because the martensite can no longer support the load. And if you look at percolation theory and you apply it to this material, then you do indeed come up with a number which is very close to 0 0.1 volume fraction of austenite at the point where you will lose percolation through the structure. There is another consequence. If you look at hydrogen going through the material, uh, the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen is very low in austenite. Uh, so this is the austenite and this is the ferrite. It's very fast in ferrite. So if the austenite percolates the microstructure, then the diffusivity will be very low because it's basically cutting out all the easy diffusion parts. So here you see the diffusion coefficient is low, low, and when we go below the percolation threshold, it rises rapidly. So in the original work, these were our four points here. And just uh, this year, this additional point has been published by these people here. Now supposing that I change the shape of the austenite, so I still have a large volume fraction, but it's no longer austenite in the form of these layers. It's, it's like here, we have equiex grains of austenite and equiex grains of ferrite. I can go continuously through the ferrite and the diffusion coefficient rises dramatically. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is that there are many features of the structure which are not simply related to the grain size or the volume fraction of the phase but if you look at the continuity of the phases that can explain things like ductility it can explain how mass transport happens through the material and so on so this percolation theory nicely shows that the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen into the steel dramatically decreases once you are uh, your, your volume fraction of austenite is beyond the percolation threshold and this only works if the austenite is in the form of layers whereas here you have equiex grains of austenite at a much larger volume fraction but the diffusion coefficient is nevertheless large okay so i've 
finished uh, my talk now and these are the two classic references that I would strongly recommend to anybody who wants to uh, study this in more detail and I will make this lecture available on my uh, normal website. What I'll do now is I'll call the conference organizer uh, so that if there are any questions uh, I can address them. Okay, so Pravash, uh, Professor Chakrabarti, I'm just about to call you. Okay. Hello, hello, Prash. So I'm I'm ready to answer answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So I I just see if there is any query question from the audience. Okay. okay. Any question? It will be good help. I'll collect the question and send it to you. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, so thank you all very much, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>